What are the problems with the ketogenic diet, you say? Well, it's been shown pretty clearly that as you limit your carbohydrates, should you stop keto and add back carbohydrates? I'm Dr. Eric Westman, and welcome back to another Dr. Westman Reacts. I was sent a video by Paul Saladino, who's a physician, very prominent internet influencer, wrote a book about the carnivore diet, and now no longer does carnivore or keto because he's convinced it's not healthy. I reviewed a few of his videos. If you haven't seen me review his, please go back and search for them. And if you don't have my top 10 tips on how to start keto right, please look in the description below. Of course, we always want to consider the source. And so despite internet popularity, despite book popularity, despite people having individual results. Consider the source. So the best I can tell, Dr. Saladino is a physician, an MD, trained at the University of Arizona. I believe through the internet sleuthing that I can do that he did a residency in psychiatry and then went out into practice, I think. I'm not sure. It kind of gets a little uh, murky there, and I haven't called him to ask him. Maybe I should do that next. And then on his bio, he says when he has a spare moment, he's out surfing. And well, so <laughs> as an internet influencer, that maybe gets you some mileage. As a researcher, that makes me just a little, uh, well, skeptical or, or concerned that in your extra moments, you know, you have to do something, I suppose, but to claim that that is, you know, a passion as well. And uh, I would love to follow someone whose passion is to actually like keep reading journal articles or, or <laughs> you become really geeky, spend time in the library looking at old library books, for example. But, you know, I suppose uh, you, you can't have everything, it turns out everything's a little messy, right? Well, so Dr. Saladino was really popular and influenced a lot of people and then turned some heads when he said he's not going to do keto anymore. But just remember, he doesn't represent a medical organization, doesn't represent a nutrition organization, doesn't represent a non-governmental organization like the American Heart Association. I mean, all these things places have their own agendas and biases. So he's coming at it from his own personal experience, or, or is there more? So stay tuned. Let's see what Dr. Saladino has to say about why you should stop the keto diet. What are the problems with the ketogenic diet, you say? Well, it's been shown pretty clearly that as you limit your carbohydrates, your cortisol goes up. Cortisol is a powerful stress hormone that has nothing good to do in the human body most of the time. If you're running from a tiger, yeah, cortisol is probably a good thing. If a crocodile is chasing me around the water while I'm surfing, cortisol is maybe good. But most of the time, you don't want your cortisol to be high. When you restrict your carbohydrates, in the study I'll show you, they restricted them to 4% of the macronutrient ratios. 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1, it's a mouthful, that's the enzyme that makes cortisol went up and cortisol levels in the blood throughout the body in these individuals were known to be higher. So yes, eating a ketogenic diet raises your cortisol long-term. And why wouldn't it? Well, so time out. Cortisol is a chronic stress hormone. I mean, I, I agree. You don't want it to be super high. And But the fight or flight mechanism, that hormone is adrenaline or epinephrine. Same thing. So I'm a little confused. The, the, if you're going to run away from the tiger or, or you know, from a a car that's running you down, it's epinephrine and adrenaline that goes up immediately. And that's what gives you the fight or flight. And then the chronic stress is cortisol. Uh, so uh, you, you wouldn't want that elevated long term. But now I'm going to get into a little difference of opinion on whether the keto diet, paleo, primal, hen or gatherer, you know, a diet without lots of carbohydrates historically is, is something you want or not. Let, let's hear what he says. Or you want to be in uh, that metabolic state. Evolutionarily in our bodies as a stressful state. So I would urge you to consider. So let, let me just think about that. That the keto diet evolutionarily was a stressful state. I, I, I don't know what that means. It, does the, um, the 
battery on a phone when it's low, does it not go into a low battery, low energy or safe mode? Doesn't it store things or change things? It doesn't check your, your reach out and check your emails as often, that sort of thing. So if, if he's saying that when times were hard and there wasn't food, you were in ketosis, that doesn't necessarily mean ketosis is bad for you. It might even be a response to that time of deprivation that actually is protective, which is a common misunderstanding. In fact, 30 years ago when I first got into this, Dr. Atkins even said that ketones are your backup fuel system. And I'm not so sure. I mean, as Jeff Volick and other researchers have studied this over the last decades, it can be your primary fuel system. It doesn't... So yes, if you're a carb eater and then you don't have food, it's your backup system. But if it's your primary fuel system, it's your primary fuel system, not not your backup. So again, a lot of paradigm shifts and changes. And if you're going to say that because times were hard, you go into ketosis, therefore ketosis is bad. I don't, I don't buy that anymore. I, I kind of understood that. And now it, it, the opposite makes sense to me. It's perceived evolutionarily in our bodies as a stressful state. So I would urge you to consider... <laughs> that you are upregulating one of the most powerful stress hormones that has aging effects in human physiology when you are eating ketogenic diet. Also, as I mentioned earlier, methylglyoxal, an important advanced glycation end product, which doesn't look good for humans at all, is upregulated by the ketogenic diet. So I'll show you both of those studies and then I'll move on and we'll really dig into carbohydrates a bit more. This is the study that I would suggest you check out if you're interested in cortisol and ketogenic diets. Dietary macronutrient content alters cortisol metabolism independently of body weight changes in obese men. Now, you know, when I saw this, I wondered, when did Dr. Saladino write his book, The Carnivore? Well, it was, and when was this article? The article was in 2007 or 2008. It's already moved. Apparently, he didn't do a lot of due diligence before he wrote the book to, to say that this was so bad he wasn't going to write the book. But when I even look into this, uh, there are 17 people in this study. And like most endocrinology studies, they, they have very few people involved. And, and then I don't think you can generalize anything from this study. It only had 17 people. And then we're not even looking at unhealthy, like diabetes, getting better, things like that. So I'm afraid it's a, a study that is, is being over generalized, overblown. As you can see here, they looked at 17 obese men four weeks of ad libitum, meaning they could eat as much as they wanted, high fat, low carbohydrate, which is 66% fat, 4% carbohydrate, that's pretty ketogenic, or a moderate fat, moderate carbohydrate, which is 35% fat, 35% carbohydrate diet. Conclusions, a low carbohydrate diet, which is 4% carbohydrates in the study, alters cortisol metabolism independently of weight loss. In obese men, this enhances cortisol regeneration by 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1 and reduces cortisol inactivation by A-ring reductases in the liver without affecting subcutaneous adipose 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1. Alterations in cortisol metabolism may be a consequence of macronutrient dietary content and may mediate effects of diet on metabolic health. Another thing we've learned through studies of low-carb diets is that there's an adaptation period. It's called keto adaptation, or on the internet, the, the, uh, the term is keto flu, but I wish they wouldn't use that because most people don't get it and it's not as serious as the flu for most people or just about everyone. So this uh, study is a four-week study in 17 people with, uh, with comparison group. But come on, I mean, and we now know, I mean, even back in 2007, if you'd asked me, I'd say, you have to go beyond four weeks. You have to, so the chronic adaptation that occurs in the movie Serial Killers, Serial Killers 2, actually, there were two movies, Serial Killers 2, the adaptation, it took six months for these two elite athletes to fully fat adapt. And then they, when they were fat adapted or keto adapted, they went into a rowboat and they rowed uh, uh, from San Francisco to Hawaii and broke the world's record by something like 15 days. But they took the six months with measuring along the way to make sure they had fully keto adapted. So, you know, to have a study that's only four weeks or two weeks is common. You'll see that, you know, it's just, no, it's not long enough to really see the adaptation period. As you can see in this study, both groups lost weight at the end of the trial. And in fact, the BMI and the fat mass 
of high fat, low carb was not statistically different than medium fat, medium carb. So thinking about what you're eating can help you lose weight. So to have a, a doctor, Dr. Saladino, be reading a study like this and then overgeneralizing it to say that, see, cortisol goes up, you shouldn't do it. Well, you can measure your own cortisol levels. So, so I, I'm sensing through the videos I've watched and, and seeing his trajectory that that he's not really on solid ground in terms of metabolism, not knowing about keto adaptation, and that a four-week study really it says nothing about long-term use. Uh, and having 17 people in there, it, it, this is not a persuasive study to me. You lose weight. You don't have to be ketogenic to do that. As I've said in the past, I think the benefits of a ketogenic diet are in that it controls appetite. But if you think about the quality of your foods and you remove foods, specifically artificial sweeteners, like I talked about in the last podcast, which will hijack your appetite and your insulin signaling, something that many people on ketogenic diets are still eating, high fructose corn syrup, as we'll talk about in this podcast, and seed oils, which will contribute to underlying insulin resistance, your satiety will be better. And you can still lose weight and eat carbohydrates. I'll repeat that statement. Yeah, I'd like to see the randomized trial on that. That statement, because it is so important. You can still lose weight. In fact, you can lose an equivalent amount of weight just improving your food quality and eating carbohydrates as you would on a ketogenic diet. And then you have all of the benefits of doing that, which are actually not getting the negatives of a ketogenic diet. So now, now I'm wondering if Dr. Saladino has read much research at all. I mean, if he missed this one before writing a carnivore, has he not read the meta-analyses of comparing low carb and low fat? And low carb wins just about every time in terms of weight loss. Now, it's not that a low fat diet can't work and a lot of people lose weight with that. And there are a lot of ways to be healthy. But when they were compared head to head, you know, in a, in a fair comparison, no, low carb really is superior for weight loss. And sure, your results might be fine and all, but w w if you're going to talk about, you know, studies and comparisons, he apparently doesn't know about those. And hormonal interruptions, electrolyte issues, sleep issues, all these things that come along with that. So first problem with a ketogenic diet, increasing cortisol clearly shown in the medical research. Second problem, methylglyoxal. I'll talk about that right now. As I mentioned, methylglyoxal is a advanced glycation end product, which looks pretty bad for humans. This is an interesting paper. Ketosis leads to increased methylglyoxal production on the Atkins diet. You can see here very clearly stated in this paper that Atkins subjects with ketosis had even greater increases in methylglyoxal, 2.12 fold, as well as acetol and acetone, which increased 4.19 and 7.9 fold respectively. So this is a study to show that methylglyoxal has been measured in patients doing an Atkins diet, both a low carb version and a ketogenic version. And methylglyoxal, a harmful advanced glycation end product in humans, was significantly raised in both of those situations. Now, this is something that I was never warned about. <laughs> Science is, is fabulous. You have to read, keep up with things. In fact, the, the hallmark of science beyond religion is replication. So in, in something like this, one finding, and, and did you notice it went by fast, but it was 14 to 28 days. Again, it, it's a short term duration. And you know we've followed people now for decades on low carb and even keto diets, and they reverse metabolic problems and don't have obvious problems from these things that he's talking about. And you know, are you getting the sense too that that there's a little bit of hype or fear mongering going on. So I'm afraid that that is a, uh, a clickbaity kind of thing, meaning you get more people learning to follow you out of fear than out of reassurance. So I'm afraid that I'm not persuaded by that study either. And they're both very small, very short term. And, and yet he is persuaded. Well, in fact, I'm beginning to think that he's trying to find reasons in retrospect of why he no longer is following one, kind of going to the literature to, to or maybe someone sent them and he's trying to, to incorporate that into his global thinking. 
but uh, these are, are one-off study. I've never seen a replication. So my point is, let's see the second study on the, the glycation product because the other the hemoglobin A1C, a major glycation product, goes down more than any other diet uh, on a low-carb diet and even a carnivore diet because you're not having all of the carbohydrates around. When I was doing a ketogenic diet, no one was really speaking about this when I was talking about this, and so I wanted to bring it to people's attentions that I fear that in many ways, methylglyoxal, cortisol, that a ketogenic diet will age you faster than if you are eating carbohydrates. And that is not a good thing. Thank you, Dr. Salad. You know, you're, you're, you have fear. You're afraid. Well, but these studies really aren't very solid. And, and I, I don't know. It seems like you're afraid of something else. I, 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 again, I, I'm not... I'm not afraid of those things. We want solid science behind it. And the idea of longevity, there actually have been a couple studies of animals like rodents on low-carb diets. And one study suggested that they lived 10% longer when they were on a keto diet. There was another study where it didn't really show much difference between a keto diet. And, and so that, again, going from animals to humans is a huge leap. And I don't generally make that kind of leap I don't, so I don't value that information so, so well. The other, other uh, aspects of a low-carb diet that would improve longevity is lowering the insulin levels. So people who live longer, centenarians, have lower insulin levels. Insulin is thought to be the growth promoting hormone or, or the downstream uh, hormones from that. So why would he be worried about you living less long. I, I, I don't understand. And uh, again, if you're my patient, I, I would say look around and see if there's other evidence that, that points to, you know, don't, don't be persuaded by something, you know, like uh, the, the weatherman has a prediction model to tell you whether it's raining here, but why don't you look out the window and, and see if it's raining? I mean, that, that's the kind of discussion I get in the idea that, uh, you're not going to live as long as, again, it's kind of worrying about something that's way out here that you can't uh, make a decision about. Again, it's into that fear-mongering kind of thing. Aging uh, is related to all of the inflammatory markers. And diabetes is a major aging condition, and you can reverse diabetes on a low-carb keto diet, not just manage it, you can reverse it. So all of those things point in the direction of actually increasing lifespan, not lowering it. We all only get a certain number of heartbeats, a certain number of breaths in our lives. I don't really want that wick to burn faster when I'm trying to do something that is health promoting. As I mentioned earlier, there are many ways to lose weight outside of a ketogenic diet. And just because you're losing weight doesn't mean something is healthy. Just because a ketogenic diet leads to weight loss doesn't mean that it's healthy for you in the long term. Is it possible that that ketogenic diet is in so many ways burning the wick of your life faster? If a ketogenic diet is aging you faster, that's dangerous. If a ketogenic oh no, I'm, I'm sensing almost that, that he's using the persuasive techniques of the vegans who don't want you to eat meat or do a keto diet for ethical and, and even sometimes religious reasons where where don't want to burn the wick you know there are a lot of ways to lose weight including chemotherapy and no no please we need better evidence than than this uh, and again is this enough information for you to be persuaded we have two very small studies of of uh, one of cortisol at four weeks or 21 days, and one of a, a glycated end product, uh, even uh, 14 to 28 days, and would like to see multiple studies on that before you call out science, science and replication. Uh, so I, I don't see that this is a lot of information to, to dissuade me from doing a keto diet. I think diet is aging you faster. That's dangerous and something for you to think about. Oh, no, not danger. <laughs> so please. So if you've watched my videos before, I, I like precision as best we can with our language. And danger is often brought in uh, to, to persuade you rather than you're on the edge of a cliff. And, you know, it's really dangerous that you're going to fall off the cliff. And 
Doctors will use that to persuade you to do all sorts of things, take different drugs, not eat red meat, things like that, when, when we want science, not persuasion. And something for you to think about. Consider this paper, oxidative stress and aging is methylglyoxal, the hidden enemy. It's a highly reactive dicarbonyl metabolite formed during glucose protein and fatty acid metabolism especially during fatty acid metabolism, as we know during ketosis. Levels are 2.12 times higher on an Atkins diet with ketosis than they are during glucose metabolism. They're elevated in hyperglycemia and other conditions. An excess of methylglyoxal formation can increase reactive oxygen production and cause oxidative stress. Methylglyoxal reacts with proteins, DNA, and other biomolecules and is a major precursor of advanced glycation end products. I'll let you guys read through this article in detail if you'd like, but is this something that is accelerating aging uh, I fear that it may be so. And, and I'm not feared, or <laughs> I'm not fearing this, I'm not feared. So uh, again, uh, even that paper was not related to a keto diet. He talked about the fatty acids and the fatty acids can go up on a keto metabolism, but we believe and we have a model of why that happens is because you're carrying your, your energy around on fatty acids to a greater degree and actually you're getting better delivery of energy to, to cells that really need fatty acids like muscle cells, heart cells. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, fascinating thing that I've seen happen over and over is taking studies that are among carb eaters, which is you know pretty much every study that's been done so far, and then extrapolating and overgeneralizing to the idea that it will necessarily apply to those who don't eat carbohydrates when it's, it's an entirely different metabolism. It would be almost like saying, since what we know on Earth is true, it will be true on the Moon in terms of gravity, for example. Well, we know that it's not. In fact, it, it was predicted that you. With the gravity would be different and your weight, your mass would be different. So the metabolism is different. Even these biomarkers will, will uh, possibly be different when the big picture view is just about all of them are getting better. And, and if you want to isolate out just one, like there, there's a classic picture and a, a figure in a paper where everything gets better, what well, gets better, it goes in the direction that you want on a low carb diet except the LDL cholesterol. In fact, it was the calculated LDL cholesterol. It wasn't even the directly measured one. And so for years I would say, oh, well, everything is better but the LDL. Well, now I'm beginning to think that you need LDL in more quantity on a low-carb diet. It, it's normal. It's actually beneficial under these circumstances to have a higher LDL level. And it's because it's a different metabolism. It would be like driving on the left-hand side of the road. You, you build the car different. You put the steering wheel on the, the, the right side, not the left. And when you go around a roundabout, you go, it seems weird. It's just different. I know that many of you who are interested in these diets are doing so for the right reasons. And the people who are discussing these diets in a positive light on the social media are doing it for the right reasons. They want to help you. But I think it's important that we understand the whole perspective when we are making a decision about how to structure our diets for optimal health, optimal aging, optimal longevity, refer to the longevity podcast I did last year. If you're curious about how an animal-based diet, which is what I do advocate for, which is like a carnivore diet, but includes uh, organs and meat, also fruit, honey, raw dairy, other sources of carbohydrates. So this is my evolution, as many of you who are familiar with my work will know. So those are the two major problems I see with ketosis. And there are many minor problems, electrolyte imbalances, hormones, sex hormone binding globulin, sleep disturbances, all things that I talked about earlier. But the major ones are cortisol connected with 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type one and methylglyoxal. So again, that is the framework of this conversation. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Saldino, I, I think you're trying to make the best out of limited information. And somehow I'm persuaded by the powers that be, I don't know if it's by, you know, the search engine optimization or, or truly that people have had bad See events considering or truly by having bad events, uh, these sorts of things need to be quantified better before you make a policy. And so my position in academia is that I'm not going to make a decision based on just me. And, and, and I'm not going to have the, 
the, oh, it's almost like a delusion to think that I can come up with the best diet. That, that's not, no. I believe that there is a, a, a group of scientists, a group of medical people who can come together and come up with a reasonable set of foods to eat that gives you great, uh, great health and longevity. I don't claim to know the best one. And I think there are a lot of ways to do it. It doesn't have to be keto, but to have the, uh, someone uh, transform or change your mind and then tell everyone else the re reason is these little things, it just doesn't jive, just doesn't fit. Um, these are not studies that make me concerned. I hope that's helpful. If you like this, please click like and subscribe so you don't miss out on further videos. If you don't have my top 10 tips on how to start keto right, and we do it using real food, no keto products or additives or, or, or even uh, supplements. Be sure to look below uh, into the description. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And check out AdapterLifeAcademy.com.